Alrighty. Hey folks, my name is Oscar Spencer. I am co-author of the Grain Programming Language, and I'm also a principal engineer at F5. Uh, my talk today is Bootstrapping Ecosystems, Unveiling the Power of the Component Model. Uh, so first up is the language. So I want to introduce you guys to a programming language called Grain. Uh, and it started as just a wee little seedling back in 2017, and it's a strongly typed, relaxed, functional programming language made just for WebAssembly. Uh, I said to myself at the time, as a language nerd, if I were to make a programming language and have anyone in the world care about it, it would be right now in 2017 with WebAssembly being turned on by default in all the major browsers. It was what I thought would be the only way to have a successful project. And conveniently enough, um, some people thought it was cool. Uh, and so we're still building it to this day. Um, at this point in time, we've got seven uh, different people who actively commit to the project, which is pretty sweet. Uh, and it's been amazing to continue building this out and be a part of the WebAssembly ecosystem. So in terms of what the language actually looks like, uh, this is uh, some grain code. And we do a bunch of concepts from functional programming languages. So you get things like really thinking about being data first and having algebraic data types, but also, we think about imperative programming styles too because we understand that not everyone can have this purely functional, amazing language that we all know and love. Unfortunately, we realize that's not what the world is. So we say, okay, let's actually include things like for loops and have things like let mute so you can actually do mutation in the language as well. Now, this has worked out really well for us. Folks like the language and that's great. But building an ecosystem is really freaking hard. So when you use a programming language, you really expect there to be quite a lot, right? So the first, of course, is a robust compiler. When you write some code, you really do expect that that code will compile into a binary that will run and do the things that you told the uh, code to do, right? And that's the first one. Second is a solid testing and debugging experience, right? Like you expect to be able to actually figure out what's going wrong with your code. Uh, you, you hope that you're not writing a bunch of code and just being left stranded with nowhere to actually debug. Syntax hiding, highlighting in your favorite code editor. We don't think about it because we take that for granted, right? You install a brand new IDE, you install whatever package for JavaScript or whatever, and hey, you've got syntax highlighting. If you write a brand new language, you actually have to go write that syntax highlighting engine. And that kind of sucks <laughs> that you have to go do that sort of thing. Uh, and the next is a language server. So when you're actually writing code in your editor and you get that little squiggly line under something that says, hey, this thing is wrong, or this method doesn't exist, that functionality comes from a language server, which is yet another thing you have to implement. And then of course, a full package manager and registry. So when people write packages for your language that they want other people to consume, they expect to have a place to publish them to and pull them back down and build projects with them, of course. And last is tons and tons of available libraries. When you look at different language ecosystems, like you look at uh, the Python ecosystem, for example, what's the best thing about it? There's a package for absolutely everything. No matter what you want to do, there's a library for it. If you look at a language like Ruby, you feel so good as a developer when you write Ruby code. And a lot of that is you go and look at the standard library and there's a function that does the exact mapping and filtering that you're trying to do so you can actually write that one liner. And it feels pretty freaking good, right? So, there's way more that goes into building a full language ecosystem than just writing the compiler. And of course, I was a little bit stupid <laughs> thinking, oh man, I can just actually <laughs> write a compiler and then that's it, but no, you have to build all these other things too. So we went all in on WebAssembly for this. Um, we don't compile through LLVM or anything like that. We go straight through, there's a project called Binarian, if you all are familiar with that, which allows you to compile Binarian IR to WebAssembly. And that's what our compiler targets. Uh, so we're going absolutely straight to WASM. But can WebAssembly help us at all in trying to build out our ecosystem? Because people like the language, they think there's a lot of really good fundamentals, they love how it lets them design programs and reason about code, but we just don't necessarily have all the libraries yet. So that brings in the component model. And so the component model gives us high-level types for WebAssembly and enables uh, us to compose modules together. That's actually a big deal, right? Because if you think about it, if you could have access to any library that was ever written for Python from your Rust code, 
or if you were writing an app and said, man, I really want to use those cryptography, uh, cryptography libraries that are written in Go, even though I'm writing my app in JavaScript, that would be absolutely huge. But this is actually what the component model gives us, right? We get this through the, com uh, the component model's uh, canonical ABI. It describes a particular data format that every language can compile to that then allows them to seamlessly talk to each other. I don't know uh, <laughs> how involved y'all have ever gotten in writing FFIs uh, between languages before, but it sucks. Like, imagine, like if you're writing uh, some Ruby code and you want to use some code that's written in C, the code that you have to write to actually make that happen, it's a terrible time. But the component model gives us that for free. That's this concept of uh, free SDKs, as we've been calling it, that as long as you can use WebAssembly and use WebAssembly interface types, you can generate bindings for these languages and get a free SDK for any language. So that cross-ecosystem library sharing is what is actually huge and what I think is fundamentally going to change how we develop software, the fact that you can pull in libraries from different ecosystems at will. So this is a slide uh, from our friends at Cosmonic. I think it really shows so well what software development is going to continue to look like. In the beginning, on the side where we've got just the PC, as a developer, not only did you have to worry about writing your app, you have to provide the libraries, figure out what operating system was going to run, and even provide the physical hardware, right? You had to go buy a server, stick it in a closet somewhere, and actually deploy your code onto it. But then we got into the realm of VMs, right? Where now developers weren't worried about the hardware anymore. Now you just have to say, let me prepare this VM, let me get this together, and then I can just deploy my apps onto it, and that's great. And then the evolution of that was containers, where we don't even care about the VMs anymore. We're just deploying some containers and they run somewhere else. And then that sort of fast forwards into Kubernetes and WebAssembly and now uh, components where we're not worried about that at all. We're simply worried about building our apps. We don't even have to worry too much about what the libraries are. And that's what's pretty huge in the component model. So the important part of this is WebAssembly interface types, uh, known as WIT. And WIT is a super developer-friendly format that allows us to describe what these interfaces look like. So basically, as long as you can write a uh, WIT interface for something, you can automatically generate bindings between multiple languages. So I'm going to show us a little bit of that, which gets us to the beautiful live coding section of the demo. So here, I've got an app. This is an app that is written in Grain, which is pretty sweet. Uh, this is an application that compiles to WASI HTTP proxy, which you've probably heard uh, throughout the event so far. And what that means is it can serve HTTP. Like, that's, that's what it means. Here, I've got a user record. Users have a name, and they have an avatar, which is an image, or, and that's bytes. And I've got a list of users here. Uh, the single user, his name is Klaus, and this is his avatar. I was too lazy to read it from a file, so I just inline some bytes. If you're curious, those bytes are smiley face, which is pretty cool. And we've got this users to JSON function. All it does is it maps over the users and creates a JSON object for them, and it gives them the name, and the value for that name is a JSON string of the user's name, and the avatar. But that's where things get a little bit tricky, because we've got an image here, and images are binary data. We can't put binary data in JSON. It just doesn't work. That's not in the JSON spec. So like any good engineer, <laughs> what do we want to do? Uh, well, we can just base64 encode it. So let's do that. Let's go over here. Let's go to the Grain website. Make this a little bigger. Uh, let's go to the documentation. And in the standard library, in the B section, there's big int, buffer, and bytes, but there's no base64. And that's a little rough. So looking here, there's a ton of libraries here. Uh, so the Grain team has been hard at work on writing standard libraries, but there's no base64 standard library. So me as a developer, what do you expect me to do? Like, am I going to go write a base64 library? Like, that seems like a lot. I'm just trying to write an app that serves a little bit of JSON. And this is the problem that new languages have. You just don't have that ecosystem just yet. So we need a way to use base64. Now. I think the big question that I'd have is, is there another language ecosystem that has a base64 library? And I think there are plenty. I bet Rust has one, and I bet it's pretty fast. Um, so let's be a 10x developer right now and select uh, an open source library. Uh, I'm going to Rust 
base64 uh, top result on Google. This is how you select open source dependencies, folks. Uh, top uh, result on Google is there's a base64 crate for Rust. And if we come down here and we look at uh, some of the examples, yeah, we can decode base64 and we can encode base64. But this is a Rust library. So the big question is, can we use this Rust library in our grain code? Obviously, when Rust is compiled and when grain is compiled, they have two completely different ways of talking and speaking about data. But we can use the power of the component model to get these two things to work together. So let's see what that would look like. Uh, so coming back over here to our application, we're going to write uh, a wit for this. And so to write our wit, uh, we need a package. I'm going to give it a name, and I'll just use my GitHub handle, which is ospencer. And we're going to call this base64. And let's give it a version as well, and this will be 1.0.0. Uh, Easy peasy. And we're going to need that base64 interface. <coughs> so we'll say interface base64. And for this interface, we need an encode function. Uh, so encode is going to be a function. And that function is going to take some bytes. And those bytes um, are going to be a byte away. And the way we type that in the component model, that's a list of U8. So list U8. And then that's going to return uh, for us a string, because that's going to be our, our base64 encoded thing. Uh, we also need a decode function. So decode, that's going to be a function. It's going to take some base64. That's a string. And it's going to return to us, uh, presumably, a list of U8. But if we actually stop and think for a second, the problem with this is we're not necessarily going to always be able to decode any string uh, from base64. It had to be valid base64, right? So let's do some little bit of error handling here. So we'll get a result. Uh, and in the OK case, we will actually get uh, those bytes. But in the error case, just for demo purposes, uh, we'll just use a string. And that's our base64 interface. Um, that was pretty easy to write. Um, and so now, of course, in the component model, uh, we have this concept of worlds. So we need a couple worlds. So we'll first have the imports world. And this is where we import the base64 interface. So we'll do import base64. That was pretty easy. And then we also are going to want to supply this base64 interface from another component. That would be the Rust one. Uh, and we can call that the exports world. So world exports. And we export base64. And that's actually our entire WIT definition. That's really all we need. And if we can compile this uh, from uh, that Rust code, then we'll actually have a component that does this that we could potentially use from Grain. So with this, let's go ahead and build that. I'm going to use a tool uh, called Wackage. And Wackage is a, a tool uh, that we use for publishing components and component types and also pulling them back down. So we'll do uh, Wackage WIT build. And that built our 1.0.1, our, our 1.0.0 uh, interface. And let's go ahead and publish that. So we'll do wackage, publish, ospencer, base64 at 1.0.0. And let's see that conference Wi-Fi working. Let's go. All right. And it published. Um, so for where these things actually get published, you actually have a choice. There are WARG registries, our WebAssembly registries, so registries specifically for WebAssembly. And there's OCI registries. And War can publish to both. In this case, I published to a registry that some of my friends created, and it's called wa.dev. So let's go take a look at that. We'll go to wa.dev. And let's search up Ospencer. Oh, there it is right there, base64. And there's the interface. Uh, we've got two worlds. We've got the imports world, which imports base64, and the exports world, which exports base64. And we see our interface there. So we managed to build our WIT interface. We published it to the registry. That means we can use it from some tooling. So let's take a crack at actually implementing that Rust component. So coming over here, uh, we're going to use a tool called Cargo Component, uh, which is an easy way to scaffold out a component for you to implement. So we'll do Cargo Component New. Let's call it Base64 RS uh, for Rust. It's going to be a library. And we're going to target a world. And the world that we're going to target is that Ospencer uh, Base64 exports world, because we're going to export. Um, I think that's everything that we need there. And we created that Base64 RS package. Let's take a look at uh, what that generated for us. 
So if we look in here, go to SRC and the library, um, this is a stubbed out component. Uh, the two things that are unimplemented here are the encode function and the decode function. So if we can manage to implement these two things, then we would have a valid component that produces that base64 interface. Uh, so let's try and do that. Let's go to that base64 folder. Uh, the name of the base64 uh, crate that we saw was called base64, so we can just do cargo add base64. And that gets us that there, so that should be pretty easy. Let's also, one thing, which is not super demo friendly, but we gotta do it, um, is Rust, the Rust toolchain will produce a WASI Preview 1 uh, module, but we need a WASI Preview 2 module uh, because that's the one that works with components. And there are adapters you can use that just lift Preview 1 components into Preview 2 components, which we'll just do by specifying an adapter. And so the name of that is WASI Snapshot Preview 1 dot proxy dot WASM. And let's just go ahead and copy that. Uh, so we'll copy adapters, uh, WASI snapshot preview one dot proxy dot WASM, and we'll copy that into the Rust folder so that way you'll be able to find it. Um, but okay, so we've got that all together. And let's actually get to implementing this now. So going back to that documentation, uh, we're just gonna do some good old copy and pasting. So we'll come in here, we'll add that use statement, and so we get our base64 stuff. And then we need this base64 standard, which has these two methods on it that we need. And so implementing encode uh, is base64 standard dot encode, and we will encode the bytes that is our input. And uh, that's our entire implementation of encode. Nice. Um, so let's figure out how to implement decode. Again, our base64 standard, and this time we'll decode uh, and our base64 input. But there's a little bit of a problem this returns a result, which is the type that our WIT interface said is a result. In the OK case is a, a VEC U8, which is fine, but the error case is a decode error. We wrote in the interface that it was gonna be a string, so we can just easily map that. So we can just do a map error, and we'll take the error, and we'll do error.toString, and that should be good. Um, I think that's everything that we really need. So let's try and go ahead and build that. I have a sneaky uh, make file for demos, uh, but we'll do uh, make uh, base64. And that just calls cargo component build and then it just copies the WASM file back up. But we just built that component. And allegedly this component satisfies that base64 interface that we were talking about. But we have a way to check. If any of you managed to catch Alex Crichton's talk on a, uh, a walking tour of WASM tools, you would have seen him do this too, but we can use WASM tools. So WASM tools, component, wit, and then we'll pass the base64 component. And there's some extra stuff in here. But here's this, uh, this root world in here, and it imports some WASI stuff, and that's to be expected. But the important thing is it exports that base64. So we've generated a component that provides that interface. Sweet. So now, the next question is, how do we use that on the grain side? So we're gonna use yet another community tool. This time it's called WitBindGen. And WitBindGen is a collection of different bind, uh, bindings generations for uh, different languages. I will admit that the grain support is not yet upstreamed, but if you're interested, you can absolutely come and talk to me after or join the grain Discord and I can get you access to it. But we'll do WitBindGen grain, and then we're gonna pass our Wit interface, uh, which is this base64 uh, interface and we're gonna target the imports world because we're gonna import it. That generates uh, some code for us. Let's copy, or let's just move the imports uh, to our app folder and we'll call it base64.gr. And let's actually take a look at what got um, generated for us. So that's this right here. And this is like a bunch of really gross code. And like this is the type of code that you would have to write if you were figuring out how to make this stuff all work. But this code got automatic, auto magically generated for us. So we didn't have to do any work to get this. It's just here. So the question is, is like, what does that actually look like using it in grain? Well, let's come in here and we'll do from base64.gr. We'll include, and since the name of the world was imports, I know the module is called imports, um, but we'll just alias it as uh, base64 imports. And then coming to our users to JSON function, we can just say use base64 imports, 
and then module base64. And if we take a look at what the interface of that module is, well, it's exactly what we said. It's an encode function that takes bytes and returns a string, and a decode function that takes a string and returns a result. So we managed to just generate some grain code that just made it look like any other grain module. So it doesn't feel any different. It just looks like, hey, this is just a module I can use now. So we can call those functions. And we can do that to complete our implementation here. So we can get rid of our to-do. And we can do base64.encode. And we'll encode the user.avatar. Um, and then that's our full implementation there. Um, and so I didn't show you all the rest of the code here, but it's just a uh, HTTP handler. Uh, and all it does is it calls our users to JSON function and calls JSON to string and returns that as a body. So that's it. Um, so let's go ahead and save that. And then before we build this, there is one more thing that we'll need to do, uh, which is there's a wit for um, the actual grain code that we're gonna write because I did say this was targeting WASI HTTP proxy. So we do need to include the proxy world, but we're also including that imports world because we are importing the base64 code. So this uh, world here is just a union of those two. Uh, so let's go into the app folder and then we'll just do a uh, wackage fetch because we just published that uh, uh, wackage wit fetch. We just published that uh, 1.0 interface. So we need to actually pull that down so that way I can find it. And then we'll come back out here and then we'll make our app. And so all that's doing is it compiles the grain code uh, with the grain compile command and gives us the WASM module. But the grain compiler doesn't even yet support components, which is the hilarious thing about this. There's just a bunch of community tooling that allows us to create components using, yet again, WASM tools. So WASM tools just embeds that wit uh, that I just showed you into the module. And then Was WASM tools component new lifts that uh, WASM module, that core WASM module, into a component. And so that gives us that component. And we'll also use WASM tools. Uh, so WASM tools, component, wit. And we'll take a look at what the wit interface of that looks like. So in the app folder, our app.component.wasm. And if we scroll up to that root world uh, that's in here, right here, this one, yes, it exports that WASI incoming handler because it's gonna handle requests, but it imports that base64 interface. So we now have a grain component that imports this base64 interface, and we also have a Rust component that provides that base64 interface. So now we gotta use the magic of the component model to actually link these two things together. And for that, we'll use a tool called WAC, which is WebAssembly Compose. It's kind of hilarious because you can just whack modules together. It's a, it's a good time. Um, but let's go ahead and do that. Um, real quick, I'll show y'all. There's a description language for WAC that allows you to describe what compositions look like. And here is what one of those WAC files looks like, where essentially I want to satisfy this base64 interface. So I say, okay, let's instantiate the base64 component, and that's going to be the Rust one. And then we instantiate our app component and we satisfy the base64 interface with the base64 interface, base interface from the other component. And then we export that WASI HTTP handler. Now this seems super complicated. And I admit, this is complicated, uh, especially since we're trying to do something that's a pretty basic uh, composition. So the way you would normally use WAC is you'd feed WAC this WAC file and your components and it would do the stuff and figure it out. Conveniently, there's been some developments in the recent months there is now a part of WAC called WAC plug, which WAC plug is smart enough to just figure it out. So you don't even have to write this WAC file. I only uh, wrote it so that way y'all can actually see what it would look like if you had to write one, but we don't even have to worry about this. So with that, let's do WAC plug. And the component that we wanna plug is that grain component that we wrote. So app, and it is our app.component.wasm. And we wanna plug it with our Rust component so that's our base64 um, component.wasm. And let's just name that app.compose.wasm in the root directory here. And WAC instantly plugs that component for us. So now if we do a wasm tools component wit on our app.compose.wasm, and we scroll up to that root interface here, 
we're still exporting that uh, WASI HTTP incoming handler, but notice there's no longer the base64 import. We've plugged that with the other component. So we've composed these two components together to create our one larger component that has all the base64 uh, code from Rust, but the rest of the code is written in grain. This is that big deal that I was talking about, because yes, I'm showing you it with grain, but you can do this with any two languages that support the component model, and that's huge. You can just start using whatever libraries you like from any language with some small exceptions, but for the most part, this is exactly how it works. So the big question is, can we actually run this and show that one app all working together? And let's do it. So we'll do wasm time serve, which is a command built into wasm time that allows you to serve components that target WASI HTTP proxy. Uh, so wasm time serve, uh, grain is a functional uh, programming language and we use tell calls, so I'll turn on tell calls and we'll need to turn on HTTP. Um, and we'll pass our app.compose.wasm and that starts running on port 8080. And so now if I come over here and I curl it, curl localhost 8080, well, there we go. We've got our name as a string, and we've got our avatar, which is a base64 encoded image. So this is massive. We managed to use a Rust library and a grain library together. And so let's take a step back here and realize what we did. In about 20 minutes here, we realized we didn't have a base64 library. So we went and just Googled Rust base64, clicked on the first result, saw there was a library. We wrote a WIT file. We implemented the uh, Rust component. It was two lines of code. You saw me do it. We then imported that into our grain code, and then we composed it all together. That took me 20 minutes up here on stage explaining all of it to you and showing a bunch of unnecessary details. But if you actually were to go and do this yourself, it maybe take you five minutes. I think that's absolutely massive and huge for what we can accomplish with the component model. So with that, we get to go back to slides, which who doesn't love slides? Uh, and I'm gonna tell you how you can get involved in everything that's going on. So first uh, is getting involved in Grain. Uh, if you're interested at all in programming languages, if you wanna write a compiler, <laughs> come hang out with us, we're pretty awesome. If you wanna work on tooling like syntax highlighting or a language server to give everyone those really happy squigglies, uh, you should absolutely come work with us. And again, the standard library. I showed you we still don't have a base64 library. I spent all my time writing this talk instead of writing a base64 library. So we need folks to actually come and work on this kind of stuff. So there's so much to do regardless of what your skill level is when it comes to compilers or language ecosystems. So visit our website at grainlang.org and join our Discord server. Also throughout all the community tooling I've showed you, it's all open source. Please, 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 if you're interested in WASM tools, like just go explore WASM tools, see what's there, look at WIT stuff, go figure out what's going on, go contribute to WASM time, go contribute to Wackage, because all these tools are necessary to building this full ecosystem that we really want in WebAssembly. And with that, thank you very much. Um, this is my blue sky handle. Um, I'm not on the other app, but that's okay. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can follow me on there. And otherwise, that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, questions, I think. So if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, when I ran the wasm time serve command, I passed a couple of additional flags, uh, and what exactly were those? So the dash w flag for wasm time allows you to pass, um, turn on a specific WebAssembly feature. And so in this case, there are a number of features that were not a part of wasm uh, 1.0, like so just core wasm as it launched in the browser in 2017. One of those features is tail calls, and Grain uses tail calls, so but tail calls these days are phase four. They're pretty much ubiquitous, so I just turned on the feature, so that's all that is. Uh, the other one was turning on the HTTP capability, uh, which actually, I don't know if that was actually necessary for this demo. Um, I think that specifically is turning on the capability to make outbound HTTP requests, which we did not do. So I actually don't, well, we can test it. We can just take a look and see if it works. Um, but yeah, I don't think we need that one because we weren't making any outbound. Uh, so let's go here. Get rid of that. And yeah, it looks like it's serving. 
and then we can kind of, yeah, because I think that one's only necessary to turn the capability to make outbound requests. But yeah, if we were trying to make an outbound request and we didn't pass that, WASM time wouldn't let you do it. Yeah. Managers for the different uh, uh, programming languages. Uh, Rust has its own package manager, like, but th this in some way is a, is a bit of a duplication, but then a cross-platform duplication. Like, how how do you see these integrating? Yeah, fantastic question. So the way I imagine it's going to play out is much of the tooling that you saw me typing on the command line. Those are all actually libraries meant to be used by the different uh, language tool chains. So. Ideally, the situation is no one actually really has to write wit. Maybe you might have to write a little bit of wit, but you won't have to go generate bindings and stuff like that. The language tool chains will actually do that for you. So we're already starting to see this happen with Rust uh, to the point where I showed you cargo component. That was actually pretty easy, where basically I said, OK, there's this interface cargo component. I want to target this interface. It generated all the code, and it generated the component for us. Um, so that was it. So that's kind of the model that we'll see all the other ecosystems do where we'll also get to the point where you can just specify a component as a dependency. You can just say, hey, um, I'm not depending on this library, but instead I'm depending on this component. And it'll come with a WIT file, and it'll generate that uh, code for you to just use it as though it were any other language, uh, library within the language. So it's going to take some time to get there, but we'll definitely see that throughout the ecosystem. And even for Grain, uh, we have plans for our package manager to implement that functionality there as well. So that way it makes it super easy for folks to consume components. Yeah, and maybe if, if I can, maybe an even more high-level high question. Um, right now, um, a lot of the demos that I see um, work, but work by because the person doing the demo knows which specific tools, which specific flags, also the flags that you added to Wasm Time to run it, for example. Yeah. Um, as an outsider, it's an incredibly confusing ecosystem, partly because it's evolving so rapidly. Yeah, for sure. Um, it, to, to me, in some way, it feels as if, as if th th there is a need for a more holistic, higher level strategy of like, how are we going to fix the developer experience at an ecosystem level. Yeah, and I absolutely promise you, folks are working on this. Like, they know it's a big issue. One of the things I'll show you super quick, um, WASM component book. Um, so there's a full uh, component model book of documentation that goes over much of the stuff that I said here. Um, so this is like the early start of that, of just explaining, hey, here's everything. But ultimately, we really do expect much of the tooling to disappear and just to integrate into developers' existing tool chains. Like, we really don't want developers to have to go figure out how to write a WAC file, for example. Like, developers shouldn't have to do that. So folks are definitely on the case, uh, and it's only going to get better and better over time. And that's where we need people to come in. Like, especially if you feel like, hey, something wasn't clear, go add it, documentation to the component book so other folks know how to accomplish the same things that you accomplished. All right. Uh, there's one question back here. Um, yeah, this is a very high level question. What <clears throat> we're, we're looking, it was int really interesting talk. And congratulations on getting your demo to work. I, I know it's harder than it looks, but um, I was wondering on a, on a higher level, okay, we have the different components. We, we've added the WIT, uh, use WIT to configure different components. We have different languages written in the different components, ideally. And, but how, do, how would that? all come together, you know, these different components, I mean, they're connected together, they're looking at that now. But as far as the end use uh, front end application, what would that look like? I mean, that's, that's yeah, I mean, it, we, we know how to do that, we know how to do this, but what's, what's the end result gonna look like? Yeah, so I think that's an interesting question. <clears throat> and I think it really depends on the particular application. Um, so there ends up being like, interfaces like these one-off ones that I just wrote for this particular purpose. But mostly the WASI interfaces are kind of the big ones that you expect different hosts to actually implement. So I mentioned WASI HTTP proxy. 
And that one is for any WASM component that knows how to serve uh, you know, HTTP requests. So a lot of tooling already knows about this, right? So that's how I was able to use WASM time and say WASM time serve. That's a perfectly happy um, server to serve this WebAssembly uh, com uh, component that I wrote. But tons of things implement this. You can run that same component in Fermion Spin. Uh, you can run that in Nginx unit. Um, I announced earlier today that Nginx is going to get support for this, so you could also run that in, in Nginx proper as well. And so it's really about those high-level worlds that we expect uh, runtimes to say, okay, I provide this world. As long as you conform to this, then, then we can run. And so you'll see that in different places, like in the browser of, okay, these are the browser things you get, or you know, running, like even if you are going to talk to a database somewhere and there are special WASM modules for that, it would say, okay, this is the standard way we talk to databases. So it's largely going to be those high-level interfaces that you're going to target, and then the one-off interfaces are really for when you're doing stuff like this of just, I want to use this one library here. But I think, that's, I think that was getting at what you were asking. <laughs> 